If you'd like to have some fun with your friends, or learn how to photograph your models, or just document your progress as you build, then hang on, because we've got a lot of ground to cover. You probably think getting convincing photos of your models is difficult and expensive, but it's not. You can achieve very convincing results with a simple point-and-shoot camera or a 35mm single-lens reflex camera. Every piece of equipment featured in this video is available at any full-service photo supply store or art supply store. Your local Kmart or Walmart can supply the film and the processing. The first concept you need to understand is depth of field. Simply put, depth of field is the area directly in front of the lens where subjects are in apparent focus. Depth of field is affected by the f-stop. The f-stop determines the amount of light that enters the camera. At an f-stop of 2.8, maybe this much area in front of the lens will be in focus. But if you change to f16, you might get this much area that's in focus. Depth of field is affected by the size of the lens. For instance, 28 millimeter, 50 millimeter, and 75 to 300 millimeter. A 28 millimeter lens set at an f-stop of f8 will give us a greater depth of field than this 50 millimeter lens for this telephoto lens set at the same f-stop of f8. Remember, for shooting scale models, you'll need a large f-stop number to get a deeper depth of field, which keeps your model in focus. If you have interchangeable lenses, try to use a wider angle lens such as a 35 millimeter or a 28 millimeter. Don't use a wider lens or the model will look distorted and unrealistic. Your choice of film also affects the quality of your pictures. There are many different color and black and white films on the market. I suggest Kodak Kodacolor Gold 100 for color prints. Stay away from higher speed films such as 200 or 400. They're too grainy. Actually, the slower the speed of the film, the finer the grain and better resolution in the print. Many of your shots require long exposures, so Use a tripod to study the camera. A cable release helps to eliminate camera shake for long exposures. Quite a lot of model photography can be accomplished outdoors, using the sun as your principal light source. As a matter of fact, the sun's an excellent light source because a photographic rule of thumb goes, the further the source of light away from your subject, the harsher the shadows. And in order to make those models look convincing, you need the harsh shadows that only the sun can cast. Generally speaking, the best sun for model photography outdoors is around 10 o'clock in the morning or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I'd stay away from shooting into the sun. It tends to hurt the eyes, and it also makes it difficult to illuminate the model. This is what you don't want to do. The sun is coming from that direction and this side of the subject is in shadow. What I want to do is move around to this side of the subject where the sun will be over my shoulder. And this lets me shoot the side of the subject that's illuminated just like the real one would be. Aircraft in-flight photos are a snap outside. You're a bit limited to photos of larger models, but if you're careful of placing your model within the viewfinder, you can eliminate the telltale handhold. A windy day or this trusty old fan spins the prop. I try to choose a cloudy sky to add some visual cues. In this case, depth of field is not a factor. 
Think about it. Ever see an out-of-focus cloud? Autofocus cameras make focusing easy, but remember, you must first focus on the subject, recompose the shot, then shoot. If you are using a simple point-and-shoot camera, check the owner's manual for the minimum in-focus distance. Use a ruler to measure this distance. You may need someone to hold the model or use a light stand and photo clamp. Then shoot the model a few times at different distances, remembering to recompose the scene for each shot. Shooting at several different distances ensures that at least one shot will be okay. This is an actual photo of a B-29 model I shot several years ago. My fan is out of view on the left and I pushed a wooden dowel through the tail gun turret to support the model. So you can get the best exposure, shoot additional shots at different f-stops or shutter speeds. This is called bracketing. Take notes during the shoot. This will help you to evaluate the photos when they're developed. This also helps you to improve the results of your next shoot. What's wrong with this photo? Just look at the size of the subject in relationship to its surroundings. Everything is much too big and only convinces you that this is a model. Getting the right perspective is an absolute must. Here's how to do it. One way of controlling perspective is by forcing it, by using models of different scales to make them look closer or further away than they actually are. For a military briefing, I wanted to create the illusion of a Wolfpack F-16 from Kunsan Air Force Base, Korea, shooting down a North Korean MiG-29. I mounted this quarter-scale F-16 model on this homemade plastic pedestal. You see this little trick here makes the missile move. In fact, you notice that I only painted as much of the model as I intended to photograph. In reality, the aircraft might be separated by about three-quarters of a mile, but to force the perspective, I placed this one 144th scale model of a MiG-29 only inches away from the F-16, giving the illusion of distance. Here's the basic setup. The two models are separated by just inches. A sheet of double strength glass supports the MiG-29 over a photo of the sky. A polarizer eliminates any glare from the glass. When I move the missile armature during the exposure, the cotton blurs and gives the appearance of smoke. The finished photo gives the illusion that the Sidewinder missile is launching for the kill. In the F-16 MiG-29 photo, I introduced three new elements that need explanation since we will use them in future photos. A simulated background or backdrop, simulated motion, and the use of a polarizing filter. You might not have a cloudy sky or a valley to shoot in. You can create your own backdrops using your own photographs. These large 20 by 30 inch poster size prints can be made at any local photo finisher, your local Kmart, or Walmart. I shot these myself so that I'd have a large selection. This is just another variation of forced perspective. The sun is behind the camera illuminating the scene. The flying model is supported by a rod in the engine. I mounted the rod on a tripod off camera. To control the perspective, I moved the flying model, which is really the same size as the ones on the ground, about six feet behind the foreground. This is the basic setup, just different models. You'll see this basic setup in other photos during this video. The simulated ground and tarmac is painted artboard, and the grass is nothing more than colored sawdust held in place with white glue. The F-16 missile shot was a simple special effect that takes advantage of long exposure times in excess of one half second. When something moves while the shutter is open longer than one fifteenth of a second, 
then it looks blurred in the final print. Some of today's high-tech autofocus cameras can automatically calculate and execute long exposures, some as much as eight seconds. But with older cameras like my Konica, you may need a handheld light meter to calculate exposures. The last element is a polarizing filter which is used to eliminate glare in the glass that supports the MiG-29. You simply rotate the polarizer to eliminate unwanted glare. We'll now combine all these elements to create our next shot. Simulated background, a simulated motion, and a polarizing filter. This photo of a North Korean AN-2 Colt was created years ago, again for a military briefing, and uses a simple trick to create the illusion of flight. Looks pretty realistic, doesn't it? I'll recreate the scene using a GB racer. Like the previous F-16 MiG-29 shot, I'll use my old Konica with a 50 millimeter lens set at F-16, giving me good depth of field. To achieve the effect of an airplane flying fast over land, I will simply move the background, which blurs it during the exposure, thereby simulating movement. Start by locating your poster scene on a flat, dry surface out of direct sunlight if possible. Remember that 10 a.m. or late afternoon are your best shooting times. The light is softer, and if there are any shadows, they are cast well to the side. Use some wooden blocks or cardboard boxes to support a sheet of double strength glass about 6 to 10 inches above the poster. In this case, I've angled the glass plate because the GB racer is a tail dragger and I want the appearance of level flight. Notice that I've taped the edges of the glass to guard against cuts. Place the model on the glass and check where the shadows fall. Then, adjust your shooting angle so that the viewing side of the subject is illuminated by the sun. Looking through your camera viewfinder, position the camera and model to eliminate shadows. Attach your polarizing filter and adjust it to reduce any glare in the glass. Since the GB Racer is a prop-driven aircraft, I'll place the fan and test its location. You may need to glue your model to the glass temporarily with rubber cement if your fan is very powerful. The last step before final focus and composition is calculating your exposure. Here is where film speed, camera shutter speed, and aperture come together. Shutter speed governs the length of time the shutter remains open, thereby exposing the film to light. A shutter speed of 1 125th of a second will freeze the propeller motion of a real airplane. 1 30th of a second creates a blur. This is also true for models if the prop is spinning fast enough. However, even a slow speed of 1 30th of a second is still too fast to freeze the image of the background as you move it below the model. So, you need to shoot at a much slower speed, 1 8th of a second and longer, so that the background will be blurred in the final print. The polarizer you added generally reduces the amount of light by two f-stops. Even on a partly cloudy day, this should be enough to allow you to shoot at an aperture of f11 or f16 at 1 8th of a second and slower. If not, wait till later in the day or use a slower film. Remember, through the lens metered cameras will automatically compensate the exposure for any filter you add. If you have to calculate exposure by hand, adding a two-stop polarizer is just like using a film that was two stops slower. For instance, if I was shooting with ASA 100 film and I add that two-stop polarizer, it's just as if I was shooting with ASA 25 film. If I had a one-stop polarizer and I was using ASA 100 film, it would be just like I was taking pictures with ASA 50 because there's a direct relationship between those numbers that, are, that you see on the film cans. ASA 100 is exactly twice as fast as ASA 50. ASA 50 is exactly half as fast as ASA 100. That translates to a one-stop difference. Once your exposure is set, compose the shot in the viewfinder and check to see if everything is in focus. Actually, preparing the shot consumes quite a bit of time. But now that you're ready, practice moving the background as you simulate taking the picture. Once you are satisfied with your procedure, take the shot. 
Remember to bracket your shots, but use your shutter speed, not your aperture. You don't want to change your depth of field by changing your aperture. When you bracket using shutter speed, you can only bracket in full stop increments, but this should work fine. Sometimes you want your model to look as if it was photographed in a professional studio. I'll introduce you to three new concepts. Fabric backgrounds, close-up lenses, and reflector boards. I shot this photo of Kevin Golden's 70mm Macbeth figure for the cover of the IPMS USA Journal. I used a studio-style backdrop as simple as a box and a piece of fabric. Macbeth is a dramatic figure wielding a blood-stained battle sword. I purposefully draped red cloth to complement the figure and create shadows to support the drama of the scene. As you can see, I have set up the shot on my dining room table. It's so disgustingly simple. You can set up anywhere there's diffused light, a porch, a veranda, or inside your garage. I placed the figure close to the edge of the table to put some distance between it and the backdrop. This ensures that the backdrop is slightly out of focus, making the figure the central point of the photo. I placed the camera on a tripod and used a cable release, but because of the small size of my subject, I needed to change lenses. If I used a wide-angle 28mm lens, the photo would require a lot of cropping at the lab to get the image size I needed. A 50mm lens was not much better. If I add a close-up lens attachment to my 50mm lens, I can move in very close to Macbeth. I chose this lens and distance combination to achieve the best composition for my figure. A close-up lens set is very inexpensive, around $15. It is used as a single, double, or triple element. Used all together, three elements let you get in very close, but depth of field suffers. Before taking the photograph, let's talk a little about contrast. Since most through the lens light meters average the light coming in the lens, too much contrast between background and subject might give you an incorrect exposure. For example, Macbeth is a relatively dark figure. Putting in a white background is too much contrast and it throws off your camera's exposure. Put in a black background and Macbeth washes out too much. You want a background that doesn't contrast too greatly with your subject. If in doubt, use a gray background. In this case, I chose red to match Macbeth's warrior image. After calculating exposure and composing, I took the shot, bracketing one stop either side of the calculated exposure in one half stop increments. This setup is a variation of the Macbeth scene using a cardboard box as the support and a colored poster board as the backdrop. Once again, you want to use morning or evening diffused light as your main source of illumination. The whiteboard acts as a reflector to fill in shadow areas. Don't use aluminum foil as a reflector as it tends to scatter light rather than reflect it. You compose the shot, calculate exposure, and reduce the shadows. This type of setup also works well for cars and trucks. Many of us like to document our work in progress, especially if we are competing in the scratch built or conversion class category of a local IPMS contest. Here's how to achieve excellent results by using flash photography. First decide which angle best suits your documentation needs. Next, support your parts on a contrasting base with modeling clay or Play-Doh. Try to hide the support. The emphasis should be on the part. Choose a close-up lens combination that gives you the composition you want. Add them one at a time until you've got it. If your subject is fairly flat, like the engine was, focusing is easy. But if you're shooting a subject with some length, like the car body, depth of field becomes a problem. My solution is to use the maximum aperture of the lens, f16 or f22, and focus around the middle of the subject. Checking depth of field, 
I can adjust the angle of the subject slightly to ensure everything is in focus. When using a flash, read your instructions so you understand how to operate your flash when it is not mounted on the camera hot shoe. To position your flash, make this simple tool. Cut a piece of cardboard square, 30 inches by 30 inches. Then, cut it diagonally. The long side is 42 inches long, or about 3 and a half feet. And the angles are 45 degrees. 45 degrees above and 45 degrees to the side of your subject is a good starting point for basic studio type shots. Experiment with different angles to achieve different lighting effects. Set the film speed rating on the flash calculator dial. Determine the distance the flash must be placed from the subject based on the f-stop of f11 or f16. In this demonstration, the distance at f11 is 4 feet. At f16, it's 3 feet. Use your cardboard angle to make adjustments to the flash to subject distance. Also, remember, each flash is different. You must calculate the flash to subject distance from your flash, not this video. If you don't have a flash diffuser, tape a piece of wax paper over the flash head to soften the harsh light of the flash. Set your camera's shutter speed to the camera manual's recommended setting for flash operation. Bracket your shots by moving your flash closer or farther away. I am shooting at f16 and the flash is three feet from the subject. By checking the flash calculator dial, I see that the flash to subject distance is two feet to make a one-stop increase in exposure and to four feet to make a one-stop decrease in exposure. Do not adjust the aperture because this changes depth of field. And don't change the shutter speed because this has no effect. If you own a variable power flash, you can bracket the shots by adjusting the power head. There is no need to move anything. Autofocus camera owners with a dedicated flash should check their camera manual for flash off camera manual mode operation. Use a piece of whiteboard for fill light. It is always placed opposite the flash and at an angle to your subject. The light from your flash will bounce off this whiteboard and reduce the shadows on the other side of the subject. Documentary shots, like these actual photos, are sharply focused and very informative when you take the time to compose, focus, and calculate exposure. The cover that I shot for the IPMS USA Journal used all the elements that I've just described, plus a few extra tricks. For the cover, I wanted to tell a story, so I sketched a storyboard to put my ideas on paper. Judging from my poor artist skills, <laughs> you can see anything will do. To tell the story, I used the rule of thirds, which tells you to divide the camera viewfinder into three horizontal and three vertical sections. To please the eye, Action flows horizontally or diagonally from lower left to top right or top left to lower right. The subject never occupies dead center because the action can't be seen. As you can see, my T-Rex howling at the moon over a missed meal follows the rule of thirds. Since I don't have a dark room or an enlarger, I needed to compose three separate shots in my camera. Some cameras have multiple exposure capability, which allows you to expose the same frame of film as many times as you want. On my Konica, I slide this lever to recock the shutter without advancing the film. Your camera is probably different. Check your instructions. All the original work was actually done at night. I set up my Black & Decker workmate and draped a piece of black cloth to eliminate possible reflections. T-Rex was posed as I envisioned. I set up my main flash, as described earlier, with a diffuser which softens the light, much like the wax paper I described. I then pre-calculated the amount of flash I would need based on an aperture of f8. I used this aperture because of the limited depth of field I needed and to conserve my flash batteries. My first exposure was of the moon in the upper right-hand corner of the viewfinder. Use a tripod because the moon must be photographed at 1 25th of a second or faster to prevent orbital blur. A long lens allows me to size the moon image to my needs. 
Your screen shows recommended exposure times for ASA 100 film. I cocked the shutter without advancing the film using my camera's multiple exposure feature, set up my camera using the shooting angle I had established in my storyboard, and took the shot. To add drama to the shot, I needed some extra lighting, so I put a red filter over the flash head. For the final exposure, I enlisted the aid of a friend to trip the shutter. To add drama to the shot, I lit a piece of newspaper for smoke and said, now. As you might suspect, it took me more than one take to get the final result. I went through 12 frames of film before I got the shot that counted. You have to be patient and willing to experiment. The presence of a person in a photo enlivens the image and adds a comparative element to an otherwise static scene. I'll walk you through the steps necessary to put yourself in the photo with your model. The first thing we need is a photograph. Use these distances and lens combinations to obtain in-scale photographs of yourself, or anything else for that matter. I'll be using a Lindbergh 120th scale model car, so I'll pose a bit further than half the recommended distance at 148th scale for a 50 millimeter lens. Have someone take the photos of you against an uncluttered background, if possible, at about 10 a.m. or late afternoon, just like the outside shots I've already done. It would be a good idea to bracket these shots also. Have your film processed and printed to a standard 3x5 size. Ask for matte paper if you can get it, but under no circumstances except a pebble finish paper. Use a sharp hobby knife or a surgeon's scalpel to cut the image away from the background. Undercut the image at an angle. Use small amounts of white glue or sobo glue to attach slivers of toothpicks for support. Also, glue a pin to the feet area to hold the figure upright on the base. Use a number two soft lead pencil to burnish the edges. Wipe off any fingerprints, then give the finished figure a shot of Tester's dull coat. For this setup, I painted a piece of artboard to look like my driveway and mounted it on my Black & Decker workmate. I like this workmate because it's easily adjustable, but you could just as easily use a sawhorse or some cardboard boxes. To establish proper perspective, eyeball the car at varying distances from the house. In this case, I'm ensuring that the size of the car is proportional to the house. I then set the whole thing up. The camera is set on a tripod with the center of the lens approximately six scale feet above the base. In 1 20th scale, a six foot tall person would be about 3.6 inches tall. In 1 72nd scale, that same six foot person would be one inch tall. Place the photo image in the scene using the pin to hold it in place. The placement of the photo image is up to you. It could just as easily be in the cockpit of an airplane or the commander's hatch of an armored fighting vehicle. The biggest limitation is your own imagination. To make this shot convincing, we need to somehow keep everything in focus from six inches in front of the camera to infinity, all the way back to the house. Even a 28 millimeter wide angle lens can't give me that kind of depth of field, but this little beauty can. Manufactured by the A.J. Fricko Company of Cincinnati, Ohio, this co-lens is really a pinhole lens with an effective aperture of F90. It gives you a depth of field from six inches to infinity. The co-lens is available for a variety of different single lens reflex cameras. Write to the address in the end credits to get the current price. The lens comes with an instruction sheet to help you calculate exposure based on your camera's metering system. 
At a fixed aperture of f90, the viewfinder is very dim. I prepare for a shot by closing my viewing eye and covering the camera viewfinder with a black cloth. I bracket each exposure with shutter speed because there is no way to adjust the aperture on the Frico colens. The results, with a little practice, can be very convincing. So you see, photographing scale models only helps you to enjoy your hobby more. For Video Workbench, I'm Chuck Davenport. See you in the pictures.